Good evening, everyone. I was uh, wondering what we should sing tonight, and I thought, well, we're when it's a Christmas season, I sing Christmas carols up here, and it is the Easter season, <clears throat> so I decided tonight I would sing one song for Palm Sunday, one song from Good Friday, and a couple songs from Easter Sunday. So we're going to start with Hosanna. I think most of you know this one. <clears throat> Just hang on one second, Mom. Uh, where'd my wife go? We don't have any. There it is. There it is. Are you doing both? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. We lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory. Glory to the King of Kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Oh, glory to the King of Kings. Uh, <clears throat> on Palm Sunday, when Christ came into Jerusalem, the people shouted these words to him when they came in, and they were excited. They put down palm branches, and their, they put down even their clothes and that. And uh, sometimes we, we lose a little bit of the meaning Hosanna was kind of a, they were expecting a different kind of king coming. They wanted a conquering king, and that's kind of what the people wanted. And Jesus actually, when he was going into Jerusalem, uh, we always think it, it was a big happy occasion, but it wasn't really for Jesus because he knew it was coming. But he also was really lamenting over Jerusalem. And at one point, in the, when you're reading about this in the Bible, he, I think, was actually in tears, you know, crying out for for Jerusalem, who have who have stoned their prophets, and 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 uh, so, um, and he was also he was also thinking, I'm sure, about the Friday after when he knew that he was going to go to the cross. And so, we're going to sing uh, uh, when I survey the wondrous cross. <clears throat> Yes. 
such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were my soul, my life, my home. And for leading us in our singing. And now we have... Uh, What do you do when your mind is blank? Huh? No, no, I can't do that. We'll ask Dwight and Sue to come sing. Well, good evening. Um, Wilma told us we should sing two packages of two songs, but my wife's a little rebellious. We're going to do one song and a poem to start with. This song kind of follows on that uh, song that uh, John just led us in. It's, it's talking about that uh, heavy sacrifice that Christ paid, but also, the, the price that it was to the Father that uh, he would send his Son to, to take care of the sins of humanity. It speaks it of, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, in, in ways that we can understand, maybe we can empathize a little bit with that as much as it's possible for us to. This is called, I Am What I Am. <coughs> God, it must have broke your heart to send your son away. Knowing all the time the final price he'd have to pay. He left his home in glory and became a common man. And because he did, I am what I am. For I'm a child of the King who made everything. I'm a son of the one who makes my heart to sing songs of joy, songs of praise. I'll sing them all I can to the one who came and made me what I am. baby of my own I wonder could I send my baby off and all alone to help someone somewhere somehow to set some captive free could I do the same for him who did the same for me now I'm a child of the king who made I'm a son of the one who makes my heart to sing songs of joy, songs of praise. I'll sing them all I can to the one who came and made me what I am. Now I'm a child of the king who 
made everything. I'm a son of the one who makes my heart to sing songs of joy, songs of praise. I'll sing them all I can to the one who came and made me what I am. So in lieu of a song, I like the poet Christina Rossetti. She's from the Victorian era, and uh, she was uh, an English writer and poet from 1830 to 1894, roughly. Um, but I like the visuals that she puts in her poems. And yeah, we're, we're thinking a lot about Easter and spring. And I'm on the board at the Th Meadow Lake Thrift Store. And I'm thinking, I'm visualizing the water coming in under the back door <laughs> <laughs> every spring. <laughs> and so, we all think of different things in spring, our muddy driveways, um, the flowers, etc. And so just, just walk with me into your own vision for a moment and what you think about at Easter time and spring. The sun arises from the sea and all around his rays is flinging. The flowers are opening on the lee. The merry birds are singing. The summer breeze is rustling past. Sweet scents are gathering round it. The rivulet is flowing fast beside the banks that bound it, like at the thrift store. Beside the, uh, all nature seemeth to rejoice in the returning summer weather. Let us with nature raise our voice and harmonize together. But not alone for summer skies shall praise unto our God be given. This day our Savior did arise and oped the gate of heaven. To sinful man, if only he, his errings will confess with sorrow, then after earth's night misery shall dawn a glorious morrow, a blissful bright eternity bought by the rising of the giver to whom all praise, all honor be forever and forever. So I like that, yeah. Okay, we're moving on to the glorious Sunday after Good Friday, Christ arose. for his foes he arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign he arose he arose hallelujah christ arose vainly they watch his bed Jesus, my Savior, vainly they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty corner on his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot 
keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. <clears throat> and because he lives, God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know, I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the calm assurance the child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know, he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day, I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's fight, no war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Thank you for that fine singing. Can we leave this on? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he rose from the dead, nothing is ever the same again. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, and part of verse 18 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Never the same again Now I know I won't be the same again From the moment 
I met Jesus, new life for me began, and I won't be the same again. I remember how he waited, how he called me by night, yet I chose to wander my own way, and nothing worked out right. Till the day I finally surrendered, Jesus healed my life. I won't be the same, never the same again. Never the same again. Now I know I won't be the same again from the moment i met jesus new life for me began and i won't be the same again he may take me through the valley even though i am his child and the road he shows me may be rough rugged for a while yet he takes my hand and speaks the word that lightens up the way i won't be the same never, never the same again never the same again now i know i won't be the same again from the moment i met jesus new life for me began and i won't be the same again never the same This may be a bit of a challenge. We're used to holding this one up close so we can see it. There's quite a few words and small printing. Uh, this is a song some of you will recognize. John has led this a few times on Sunday mornings. Uh, it's called My Worth is Not in What I Own. But are the words ever good? So if we wreck the melody, pay attention to the words. <laughs> They're fantastic. <clears throat> My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other, my soul is satisfied in him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by, but life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other, my soul is satisfied in him alone. To wonders 
here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other, my soul is satisfied in him alone. I would like and sue for bringing those songs to us, beautiful music with beautiful words. Yeah. So tonight we have a speaker, and I think most of you probably know more about him than I do, so I'm going to introduce him as Peter Eason, and he's going to speak with us. Then I don't have to hold this. Um, thank you, Wes. And um, I thank you again, John, uh, Dwight, Sue, and Marge for the beautiful music. Uh, Christina Rossetti wrote one of my favorite Christmas carols in the bleak midwinter. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she's a marvelous uh, uh, poet. Um, many people might be surprised, maybe not surprised, to know many of the great uh, poets, artists, thinkers through the ages um, often struggled with personal things within that weren't always easy to talk about. Christina Rossetti suffered with depression, I believe, most of her life, and probably at a time when you couldn't talk about it the way we do now. And uh, so for many people, it's uh, been a, you know, a, a battle that they have fought. And many of us know with our own experience, within our families, how through the years that has uh, taken a real toll. And yet uh, people have no idea for the most part. Uh, I love how, so well, I don't really love it actually. I can't stand it when people make the assumption because you're, you know, you got a smile on your face all the time, or not all the time, but sometimes, well, you know, life must be pretty easy go for you. Um, I, I, I tend to wear my heart on my sleeve, so if I'm smiling, I, I usually am in a pretty decent mood. I try to avoid people when I'm not in a good mood or I'm not doing well. That's not never been easy to do as a pastor because you got to show up fairly regularly if you want to keep your job. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I haven't seen the pastor for a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, he just doesn't want to see you or anybody else, actually. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Get the search committee together. <laughs> anyway, uh, but you know, the reality is, is that no matter who we are, um, we're going to struggle. And, and that song by the gay, there's a great song. But I do take umbrage with some of our songs sometimes. You know, when we say things like, you know, I have no fear. Really? You never have any fear? Wow. I'd like to talk to you after because I'd love to learn what your secret is. I think we all, no matter how deep our faith runs, have moments of fear, have moments of doubt, have moments of struggle. So, um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, Henry, for inviting me and paying my way. <laughs> I, uh, for Karen and I, uh, some of you may know us. I don't assume everybody has. I recognize a lot of your faces.
faces. Please forgive me if I don't remember all your names. Um, we're at a 50 plus gathering, so I think I can get away with saying, you know, sometimes, you know, the memory isn't what it used to be. We're going to talk a little bit about that as the uh, evening goes on. But uh, for Karen and I, uh, just to, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, we originally came to Meadow Lake two years, I guess, after I found out Henry and Irene did. So we first came to Meadow Lake in 86, and we're here with the Salvation Army. We're, we've been retired officers with the Salvation Army for, uh, we retired three and a half years ago, I guess, almost four years now. And we had 35 years with the Salvation Army, starting here, and then in a little community, some of you will know, Maple Creek, from there up to a place nobody's ever heard of, Whitehorse, Yukon. Uh, then from there to the inner city of Winnipeg, and Whitehorse really was inner city ministry too. Inner city Winnipeg, inner city Regina, and then in 207, uh, same year that the Clarks came back, we were uh, posted back here to Meadow Lake, which we never expected, but we welcomed because we had loved it when we were here the first time. So uh, when we retired, uh, yeah, nearly four years ago, um, there was another officer brought in. Some of you may have met her, I'm not sure. But of course, COVID hit, and we all know about that. We don't need to go into how that affected everything and everybody. Uh, so right now, what's happening is, because, you know, I've, I've learned this a long time ago, that like most communities, word travels very quickly. It's not usually accurate, but word travels quite quickly. So for all of you who've heard the Salvation Army is closed, I'm here to say, that's not quite true. Uh, will it close at some point? Yes, I'm sure it will, which is too bad. But the reality is, is as most churches can attest, there is an incredibly, uh, the pool, I guess you could say, for new officers or pastors has almost completely dried up. And for the Salvation Army for the last, I'm going to say, decade to 15 years, our numbers have fallen off the cliff as far as getting new officers in. And in the last number of years, it's become even worse than that. So the reality is, after our uh, officer left here, uh, was assigned to Melfort last summer, uh, they weren't bringing anybody in. So Karen and I have stepped back in just to kind of keep our, our fellowship going, because that's our church and our folk who go there, our family. And, uh, you know, we, we want to, as long as we can, keep things going. We're by no means anywhere at the... Uh, I guess at the uh, level we were when things were fully running, uh, we can't go back to that, and you retire for a reason, and uh, or more than one perhaps. But uh, but nonetheless, we're grateful to be able to keep a couple of uh, uh, throughout the month gathering a couple of times. My wife does some stuff during the week there as well, just to keep uh, things going until they tell us that's it. So uh, we'll just continue to soldier on. A uh, little bit of background, my roots are in Newfoundland, uh, raised uh, because my parents were officers, we moved around, so I wound up growing up in the little town uh, of Toronto, and, uh, and then made my way out west here, uh, just as I was coming into my teens. Uh, very brief stint here in Saskatchewan, then off to Alberta, where I met my beautiful wife, who is an Alberta farm girl, and her family still farmed there. About 45 minutes out of Red Deer, if any of you know that area. And a little town called El Nora. No, it's not ringing any bells. The Oak Ridge Boys used to sing a song about it. Oh no, that was Elvira, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Elvira, El Nora. I, I used to get teased relentlessly by my buddies about that. Because that was a big hit then, and I was dating a girl from El Nora. Anyway. <laughs> So we, uh, when we met, we got, we got married um, in Calgary. We had our first child there. I was working for, at that time, a shop in, in, in the city for the Calgary Co-op. My wife got her, her degree, her certificate in secretarial work, and it wasn't even a computer, if you can imagine. But she got a job with the Alberta government, so we were set for life. Well, it didn't really work out because God called us into Salvation Army officership and then we were broke for life. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sorry, just joking. We didn't get into it for the money, I can tell you that. But that's okay because 
I think if you're in it for the money, you're absolutely in it for the wrong reason, and you won't last. So, uh, but no, we are very incredibly grateful to God for uh, an incredible ride that God's given us. Um, I wouldn't even attempt to go into the stories. I will tell you, however, we are incredibly grateful to have five wonderful, wonderful children and numerous other, not our blood kids, but kids that were a part of our home and life through the years that needed a place for a time. Uh, we have six wonderful grandchildren. Seventh is on the way, God willing, this July. So um, much to be grateful for and joyful for. Uh, presently, um, when we retired with the Salvation Army, I was talking to Dwight about, um, you'll notice I have a police chaplain shirt on. I've been doing uh, volunteer chaplaincy work with the RCMP for now about, well, volunteer work for about 12 years. And then the last three years or so, I've had a, a part-time contract as a Northern District Chaplain with the RCMP. So I get to visit detachments throughout the North, right through Meadow here, Pierce Land, Loon Lake, Waterhen, uh, even down a little further south from time to time. Um, and it's an incredible ministry, an incredible opportunity uh, to know and to develop relationships with some amazing people. Uh, pray, for, pray for police officers, male and female. I don't need to go into the details because you've heard the news about the shootings, the school shootings, the other things, whether it's here or in the States. I'm going to tell you right now, and I'll, you can come up and challenge me after if you want, but most of us don't have a slightest clue what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Have no concept of the danger in this community and surrounding area they're in constantly. You just don't hear about it on the news. But it's sad because it's increased in the last decade or more here in exponential ways that most of us couldn't have dreamed. And it's a shame, but it is what it is. But pray for them and uh, pray that God not only will keep them safe, but a number of them are uh, men and women of, of Christian background and faith, others of other faiths as well, and some who, you know, would say they have none. But everybody has faith in something. Okay, everybody. Somebody says, I don't believe in God, I have no faith. Well, you do have faith. You have faith in yourself. Everybody's been given a measure of faith. It's who your faith is in that really matters. I think we would all agree with that. You know, um, and you can choose. You put your faith in whoever or whatever you want. It's, it's totally up to you. It really is in many respects. But you will have to live with whatever the consequences are of that particular choice to put your faith in whatever it is or whoever it is you choose to, to do that. But pray for them and, our, and all of our first responders. They have an incredibly tough, challenging work. And uh, in these days particularly, it's been extra difficult. So um, at any rate, a uh, couple more things. Some of you will remember Pearl's Home. How many ever heard of Pearl's Home? So many of you will maybe remember Pearl. She's now in a care home in Calgary. But when we came back uh, to Meadow in 207, we quickly, through the Salvation Army, linked up with Pearl because we worked with the same people and developed a wonderful relationship with her and that wonderful ministry that I don't think a lot of people really understood or knew what was really going on. And I think there were a lot of rumors about things. Most of them were hogwash. I'll use that term to be polite. Um, and, uh, you know, she just uh, had a call from God to open that place up to people that otherwise would have died on our streets years ago. So uh, a number of years back, sadly, Pearl's health failed in every way. She lost her husband and then her own health failed and she couldn't take care of the place. So for about six years, Karen and I along, for the first couple of years, Pat Geddeson helped us and then after that, Pat wasn't able to continue, but uh, we kept Pearl's home going. And then last uh, summer, for a number of reasons, primarily the, just the house itself. There was no money to keep it renovated and it was never government funded. Um, Pearl uh, literally, I, I can say this, bankrupted herself. She literally bankrupted herself personally to run that place. Never saw a dime of government money nor did she want government money because there would be considerable uh, influence and things that would have to be done that she really didn't feel she wanted that interference. So it really was a great ministry. 
Um, the guys that were there have all found other places. We're still involved with a few of them, very, very much so. Some of them come to our church. I'm a trustee for a couple of them and have been for many years. Uh, Karen, after, well, she was doing this for a while, does some home care for one of our ladies, as well as uh, her work at the church. So uh, we still have a number of things that are going on, but when people say, oh, you'll be busier after you retire than you were before, I say, you, you, you have no idea, <laughs> not even remotely that busy, and I, I'm never going back to that. So, I mean, you know, busy is kind of a relative term for some people, I'm pretty sure. But, uh, yeah, no, we're not thankfully that as busy as we were for all those years before. But still, God has given us some great opportunities for ministry for which we're very grateful. And um, I will be profoundly grateful to God that most of our ministry, if not all of it, has primarily been amongst people who live on the ragged edge of life. Okay? They're the people... I identify with the closest, even though that's not really who I grew up with as a kid. Those are the people I identify with through my life most closely. And that doesn't make it easy. Let me tell you, <laughs> it's, it's not for the faint of heart, but it is an incredibly rewarding uh, ministry. So tonight, I'm just going to share a few thoughts. Uh, did you plug the meters? Uh, you don't want a ticket or anything? Oh, no, no, we don't have any meters out there. Good. I won't keep you too long. Um, the reason I can say that is because I, I have this here that if I stick to it, theoretically, theoretically, I should be able to get you out of here by 10. Um, just teasing. There's hockey tonight. We all want to be home. Um, but I want to share a few thoughts that really I wasn't given any theme to work with. And, and so I, I chose the theme earlier and it actually isn't Easter so you can stone me later if you wish but uh, we've already talked about Easter which listen we got to talk a whole lot more about it but I trust that if not here at the churches where I hope you're able to attend you'll you'll of course be hearing much more about that as Palm Sunday is this Sunday and then Holy Week is next week so um, join me in prayer for a moment though as, uh, as I prepare to share some thoughts. Heavenly Father, uh, wonderful creator, I want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you, God, that you are our great and awesome God who is holy and who is uh, alone uh, worthy of all praise and all thanks. Lord, thank you for your incredible love for us. Thank you for a grace that is greater than our sin. Uh, thank you, God, for mercies that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And God, even as we acknowledge um, our own weaknesses, even when we sing songs that say great things, but sometimes not entirely accurate, we do fear sometimes, we do struggle, and we know if we're honest, many times we fall short of what we know we ought to be. And yet we're so grateful that your love is greater and your grace is greater. Thank you that while your grace uh, is not cheap, and must never be cheap, and it is also profoundly free and wide and deep in ways that um, many, I, I don't think any of us can fully grasp. But God, thank you that you have um, demonstrated that to us, not just showed it to us in some sort of abstract way, but you have demonstrated that for us, the scriptures telling us in Romans that you, you demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And I thank you for dying for me and for each one of us here, for every person that's ever walked on this planet of every nation, language, tribe, and color. And while not all will believe upon you and receive that salvation, it's your desire that all would. And so God, we pray tonight that uh, if there would be anybody here tonight who, who has yet to really surrender their heart to you, that they would know you are more near than the breath that any of us take. and You are more than willing to come into the heart that is open to you in humility and in repentance, acknowledging our need of you and, and, and your salvation, but being assured that um, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, there is nothing your blood can't cover that we can't be free from. And regardless of uh, what others may think or say, about us, uh, it's your say-so that matters, 
and it is your, um, you who have the final say in all things. And so we thank you for that. So God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. So I decided tonight I would try to use somebody else's material because I didn't have to spend as much time preparing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being honest. I, uh, I, 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 it's not entirely true. It is true that I didn't have to do as much preparing. But part of the reason why I chose this is because I thought this is a message we all need to hear it because I, I need to hear it and I've read it over many times. And I thought, why wouldn't I share this? But I got to give credit where it's due. So unless you think I'm far smarter than I am or a much greater writer than I am, I'm going to tell you who wrote this, okay? So the guy's name is David Roper. How many read the Daily Bread? You ever heard of the Daily Bread yet? Okay, so David Roper is one of the contributing writers to the Daily Bread for decades. He and his wife are now well up in their 80s. They live in Idaho, I believe. Uh, he's been retired for some time, but they ran in their retirement years a ministry for pastors and people in ministry who needed retreat to find some healing and help to get away from it all. But for decades, uh, ministered in various churches in the United States. Anyway, David Roper is a, a real outdoorsy guy, a guy I can really identify with, um, a very down to earth but brilliant guy who's very, very well read and, uh, and shares some fantastic insights. And uh, I stumbled upon him a few years ago, um, a number of years ago actually, during a very dark, dark time in my life. Um, that doesn't do justice to what, how dark it was. I'll just say a very dark time in my life. And I stumbled across David Roper's writings, and they were a godsend for me. Uh, somewhat of a lifeline, shall we say. And I've always appreciated his writing ever since. So um, my wife and I just celebrated last year 40 years um, married. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, she really deserves work. <laughs> She's stuck with me, I'll tell you. It's not a, that's, a, that's a task. Um, and I think that along with, um, like all of us, so this is what I'm going to share with you. This happens for all of us. But we've, uh, in the last three, four years, we've lost three of our four parents. Um, and uh, because we moved around, we've never had family here, right? So my family are, and Karen's are spread out. So having an ailing parent down the road or in the same community to look after has never been our privilege to have that. As challenging as that can be, let me tell you, it's, it's no fun being so far away you can't do much, uh, nor in a position maybe to afford to even get to where they are sometimes. So uh, it's been a, that, that, that passage of time and everything, along with numerous other things, retirement and whatnot, um, has really uh, brought home the whole reality of aging. And this is a 50 plus gathering. So I'm, I think I can talk about this here and this should resonate with most of us, I, I think. And um, David Roper wrote a book called Teach Us to Number Our Days. Okay, so the title is right from scripture, Psalm 90 verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Okay, wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. With all due respect to you degreed people, and I come from a family of many degreed people, the only degree I've ever been given is the third degree, but uh, I can tell you I'm a, I'm a part of a family with many degrees, and they're fine, but they don't always translate into wisdom. Far from it. And if, you know, you can have both, but just because you have one doesn't mean you have the other. <laughs> so, uh, Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And David Roper's words here, uh, I think, uh, have tremendous wisdom. So I'm going to read them to you. I may interject a couple of thoughts in between. And uh, I'm not progressive like my wife. I have to take my glasses off because I'm not going bifocal anytime soon. I'm holding out. So I'm 
just going to keep this here. I, I noticed I'm not the only one. Uh, you, you know what? If you do, then I'll need my glasses again. <laughs> but thanks for the offer. So this particular chapter in David's book, Teach Us to Number Our Days, is called Ageless Delight. He starts with a quote from uh, Thomas Aquinas, who is an early church father. And Thomas Aquinas writes this. It is against reason to be burdensome to others, showing no amusement and acting as a wet blanket. Those without a sense of fun, who never say anything ridiculous, and are cantankerous with those who do, these are vicious and are called grumpy and rude. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just saying that's what Thomas Aquinas says. If the shoe fits, however, you know, maybe we need to think about it a bit, eh? David Roper goes on to say, a few fortunate senior citizens go on pretty much as usual with few parts out of order. But for the majority of us, aging takes its toll. The odd thing, however, is that most of us don't feel old. Oh, there are days when we feel every one of our years, but in general, there's a vast discrepancy or disparity between the sight that confronts us in the mirror each morning and the young person that resides within. David writes one of my favorite quotations from an author by the name of Frederick Beekner. I don't know if you've heard of him. He wrote a book named Godric. David writes that a quote from this author hangs in a place of honor over his desk and expresses this heartfelt sentiment. Deep inside this wrecked and ravished hull, there sails a young man still. <clears throat> he writes, I'd like to keep that positive outlook till the end. To think of all the things we used to do in the good old days and can't do anymore only makes a body feel worse. It's much better to poke fun at oneself rather than grumble and complain. Arthritic joints, Hearing and memory loss and failing eyesight are no fun. But we can survive them by managing to see them, among other things, and despite all, as desperately funny. Now here I'm going to interject some thoughts. So you will see me oftentimes with my buddies. We're nicknamed Huggy and the Misfits. I'm Huggy because I love to hug, and I am a misfit. But the guys I hang with, Ronald LaRock, you know little Ronnie that ro walks around town? Jeremy Kuliner, Jerry Ben, and a couple of other guys, we'll go out for coffee every week. I gotta tell you, you, you many of you will be very surprised that uh, Ronnie particularly has a killer wit. Absolute killer wit, as long as he's sober. And, uh, and he struggles, so pray for him on that. But um, when we're, I remember some, oh, quite a while ago, we were talking about something. <coughs> And I couldn't remember, surprise, surprise, who it was I was thinking of. And he, he looks at me and he says, oh, you got some timers, eh? I said, what? No, that's not all timers, but it's some timers. <laughs> I said, that's a great line. You're right, I do. I've got some timers. It's becoming more like all timers at times. And we know it's not all timers, but it gets pronounced that way. My dear mother right now, who's the last of our parents alive, doesn't know who I am and is completely in her own world in Winnipeg. And yet, when I meet with, when I visit with her, I try to make her laugh, which sometimes works. Another line of Ronnie's that I find hilarious is that, along with the sometimes line, every now and again we'll be talking about something and, and, and it will indicate that maybe, you know, uh, something didn't make sense. And so he'll say, you know, you need a checkup from the neck up. <coughs> you better see your doctor for a checkup from the neck up. So these are some of the lines that I find really quite funny, quite hilarious, and they are often associated with aging and how, it, how easy it is to forget certain things and struggle with various other things. There's something delightful about old folks who keep their sense of humor. They're a joy to be around. Like the 80-year-old gardener who, when asked how old he was, said, I'm an, oct I'm an octogenarian. 
<laughs> okay, nobody got that. Good. He's 80 years old. He's a gardener. He's an octogenarian, not genarian. Okay, I'm going to write to David. Tell him, take that one out of the book. That's not funny. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> true. However, an old man with a, with a young mind and a quick wit is the kind of person you love to be around. So much better than being a grumpa, as one little girl described her gloomy grandfather, grumpa. Back in the 19th century, David writes, there was a Methodist minister, which, by the way, is the roots of the Salvation Army. In case you where did the Salvation Army come from? rooted in the uh, Methodist Wesleyan Church and in East End of London where it began. This minister might well have known our founders, uh, William and Catherine Booth. Dr. W.H. Lax, he was a Methodist minister who worked among the poor in, in London uh, during that time. This is what he wrote. The age of the body, apart from actual disease, depends upon the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, and the like. These are set for a certain period. They may get worn out, either by fair wear and tear, or much sooner by unfair wear and tear. You cannot always help that. But you can control the age of your mind. You can, if you like, or rather you can if, or sorry, you can if you face life in the right spirit, keep the mind young almost indefinitely. And remember that the mind controls the activities and energies of all uh, the rest of the body. It is the supreme organ. If you let the mind grow old, the body will grow old also. How are you to keep the mind young? The most important thing is to cultivate a cheerful spirit, never allowing pessimism to gain the upper hand. Make your mind up to maintain a buoyant outlook on life. When the sun shines, let it shine on you. Gray days will come, but always think of the sunny days which must assuredly follow. And I'll just interject here, I love this time of year. Hey, after the bleak midwinter, it's wonderful to see longer days. Hang on to your sense of humor with both hands. The older you grow, the more you will need it. Most of the neurotic wrecks one sees, and some of the mental ones, are the natural result of a morbid outlook on life. And keep an open, active mind. You cannot keep the mind young if you persist in looking at the gloomy side or in closing it to new ideas, muffling it up in prejudices and stifling its enthusiasms. It is losing the thrill and zest of life that makes a man old. He doesn't lose the thrill because he is old. He becomes old because he's lost the thrill. The moment a person loses his sense of wonder at the beauty of a sunset or the glory of heroism and self-sacrifice or the intricate markings on a butterfly, swings, or the marvels of science, he becomes old. So writes this minister from the 19th century. How many have heard of G.K. Chesterton? He's a great writer. Um, if you're familiar with C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Chesterton was one of the key people in helping lead C.S. Lewis to faith in Christ, along with J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, which is a wildly popular series of books, brilliant books, really. At any rate, G.K. Chesterton uh, writes this about humor being a great component of joy. Chesterton calls it the gigantic secret of the Christian, the dominant theme of Christian faith. Christianity, he says, satisfies suddenly and perfectly in this, that by its creed, joy becomes something gigantic and sadness something small and special. In other words, faith leads us to holy humor. Faith puts its trust in God's wise providence, his compassionate, kind-hearted care, his unfailing love, his promise that someday he will take us to be with him forever. These are the infallible truths that sustain us, that enable us to rise joyfully each morning, whatever we have to face throughout the day. 
Israel's prophet, or one of them, by the name of Habakkuk, wrote this in his uh, book of the Bible, one of the smaller books in the Old Testament, chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, from the Message Translation. Though the cherry trees don't blossom, and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm-eaten and the wheat fields stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior, God. There's a scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians, as I was reading this over, that uh, reminded me of what David wrote here, and such important words for us as uh, those who follow Christ. And uh, Paul writes these words, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verses uh, 16 to 18. Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I thought that song, uh, Dwight and Susan, that you sang, I think that last one, great words about, you know, I am not, my identity, my worth is not in the stuff of this life. And uh, one of the things as a pastor or as a Salvation Army officer you wind up doing, or at least many of us do, is many, many funerals, many funerals for the youngest to the oldest and one of the things you're always struck with is there's nobody taking anything with them okay nobody's taking anything with them when Jesus says store up treasure in heaven he's making it clear to us that the things that ultimately will last are the unseen things which are the matters of the soul the spirit and the only thing with a soul and a spirit on this earth is human beings of every nation, language, tribe, and color, all made in the image of God, all given that spirit, that soul within. And uh, investing in the lives of people, ultimately, is what will last. Everything else will wind up in somebody else's hands, maybe family or whatever, which is fine, great to be able to leave something to them, but eventually it'll be gone to somebody else again and again and again. You know, there's a parable in the New Testament where Jesus talks about one one of the a wealthy man who had had a a profoundly good year bumper crop like beyond wildest dreams. He had way more than what he could ever use. He filled up his barns to overflowing, and Jesus said that the man asked himself, "My goodness, I've filled my barns to overflowing. What should I do? I still have got tons left over." I know, I'll build more barns. And he stored up more and more and more for himself. And Jesus said, in the parable, he said, that man was a fool because that night his soul was required of him. And of course, he left that all behind. How many times do we think we need to invest in more and more and more stuff of this life that will be left behind and yet we miss the opportunity to do something for others to be a blessing to them, to help them along the way, and more importantly, to hopefully point them to Jesus and to the reason for the hope that we have as believers. Life holds many challenges for us all. I've had some people comment about the fact that we retired younger than some people retire. My answer to that is simply this. It's the miles that are on you, not the age of the, of, the, of the vessel. Some of us have had very hard miles. You know, I often tell the story when I worked in the shop for a few years in Calgary. It was a great, it was a wonderful experience for me. I made some great lifelong friends there. Um, but life lessons were great because sometimes we'd get vehicles in that... Uh, Man, they were beautiful. They were old. They'd been babied. 
they've been looked after, they were restored, or maybe not even restored, they were just kept in such pristine condition, they'd come in to get the oil changed and whatever else, and you'd just be like, wow, how do you, how do you get a car like this, right? But you'd look at the odometer, it hardly had any kilometers on it, really. I mean, for its age, you go, oh my gosh, wow. But I'll always remember one day, a lady brought in a, I think it was a Crown Vic. Remember the old Ford Crown Vics? They were, this one was loaded. It was a nice big Crown Vic. She brought it in and seemed a little puzzled about why she was there. She said, somebody told me I'm supposed to get oil changed. <laughs> that was the first clue that there could be trouble. So here I am changing the oil on this thing. I pulled the plug out of the pan and nothing came out. <laughs> nothing, not a drop. I went over to my buddy Brian. I said, come here. I just pulled the plug on this and it's like a three-year-old car. Three years old, pristine looking. Anyway, uh, he said, grab a, grab a screwdriver. So I did and pushed it in and sure enough it had gunked, everything had gunked right up. And it was, that engine was pretty well done. So we brought it down, we had to break the news to her. But I looked inside, you know, and I mean, it, yeah, it looked pretty young and beautiful car. I couldn't believe how many miles were on that thing. I don't know what she was doing or who was driving it, but they drove it and drove it and drove it and did not care for it. So on the outward, it looks like, oh, that car's in perfect shape. Yeah, check the odometer. <laughs> check under the hood. Everybody's got a different story. Everybody's got a different experience, right? But one thing about life that we must never forget, and uh, these are the words of a, of a theologian, a Danish theologian named Soren Kierkegaard. He said this, maybe many of you have heard this, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. I don't know about you, but when I look back on Karen and I's journey, there are things that for the life of me, at the time they happened, I could not have, I could, I, I was completely at a loss. Why is this happening? And I'm talking like serious life and death hanging in the balance things. Nothing's going to be the same anymore. Why is this happening? Made no sense. But you know, the benefit of years, if God grants them to us, is that if we'll reflect sometimes, we'll realize as the years go by, hmm, I don't fully still understand why that or these things happen, but you begin to be able to trace some things that came out of that experience, that have done things in your life that are good, that could have never been done any other way. And you begin to realize that there's a much bigger thing happening than we can comprehend. Um, Persian rugs come to mind. Those beautiful tapestry rugs, right? And the handmade ones, I think India is where a lot of people, uh, they're very good at making these gorgeous, gorgeous rugs. But have you, ever, have you ever looked on the other side of a rug like that? A really beautiful loomed, like a handmade loomed rug? Looks like a dog's breakfast. I mean, it's a rat's nest. You, if you looked at that first, they said, yeah, this is worth $5,000 or $10,000. You go, I'm not giving you 10 cents for it. That's ugly. But then they turn it around, and you see the mosaic, and you're absolutely flabbergasted. You realize it's worth every penny of that, maybe more. Life has to be lived in forward, but really, it's as we look back, we begin to see gradually. Not all of it, but gradually to see some of the things that God has allowed. Last thought, and then I'll leave you with a benediction. See, I stuck to my notes pretty close. Um, my dad had a saying, a scriptural saying, uh, that I'm very grateful. As a kid, I, you know, as a kid, you don't appreciate a lot of things. Dad would say this all the time, and I would go, okay, whatever. But it came out of the book of James. And my dad would always say about the future, he would say, Lord willing. Lord willing. That was
us this phrase all the time. So if we were going to go, say, to the little cottage my, my grandfather built in the Muskoka Woods north of Toronto, in the summer we'd all be excited and dad would say, well, Lord willing, we'll be up there for the summer. And I didn't understand at the time the significance of that. But as I grew older and read my Bible, I realized in James chapter 4, those very words are there, where James talks about people who boast and brag about how they're going to do this and that. They're going to go to that city and make money. They're going to be successful and all this kind of stuff. James says, you don't even you don't realize your life is a vapor. Your life is a mist. It could be gone just like that. That comes home to me many times. How many, I don't know if any of you were at the funeral for Brittany McNabb, a young school teacher here in Meadow Lake who passed away at 24 years of age about three weeks ago. Had her life before her. I mean, absolutely out of the blue. No indication whatsoever her life was going to come to an end. She dropped of a heart attack on the spot in front of her mom and dad. That was it. Nobody's guaranteed anything. And sometimes we have to acknowledge our arrogance in thinking that somehow we control these things. We do not. God does. God has the final say. And that's not to say, I mean, God's, in God's sovereignty, he's given us a ton of latitude and free will. And so we can, we can, we can sabotage some of that of course, by choices. And there are things, of course, we wonder why God would ever allow it, but he has given us choices. We have to live with consequences. That's the hard part. It's great to have choice, isn't it? It's not so much fun when the consequences come and they are far from what we want to deal with. But that's the way it is. But that whole idea of Lord willing is something that I think as I wrap this up about our own lives, with aging and everything else, it's so important to remember that however long God gives us, we preface it by saying, God willing, you know, we've got a, still a good stretch ahead of us. God willing, we're still going to be able to do some things that are meaningful and good and bring a measure of satisfaction. And hopefully, ultimately, glory to God. Something that lasts, something that's invested in more than just the temporary things of life. So that's James's word to us, to be so careful to remember that it is ultimately in God's hands. Let me leave you with this prayer from Psalm 92. I'm going to uh, read it as a benediction for every one of us here, myself included, because everything I've shared tonight applies to me, uh, as well as I trust to you and need to be reminded of these things regularly. Psalm 92 uh, says this in verses, uh, I think it's 12 to, yeah, 12 to 15. And I pray this will be so for you, as I pray it will be for me and for Karen. So for you and your loved ones, your family, may this be said of us. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Amen? Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for listening. I don't know if you've ever been to 50 plus before, have you? Uh, some years ago, before okay. I was 50 plus. Oh, okay. <laughs> I stuck in. They didn't ask for ID. They still don't. They still don't. <laughs> so, uh, I guess if we say it right, the Lord willing, we'll meet in April last Wednesday. No other announcements? Uh, uh, 
Watch for the ice. And have a good evening. Thank you.